Philippians 2, please. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2 and verse 19 through the end of the chapter. That's where we're going to be for our time this morning. Echo, 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 echo. Philippians 2, 19 through 30. I'll, I'll tell you now, it's kind of interesting. You, you don't plan for things like this to happen. You don't really intend for them to happen. And yet sometimes they do. Uh, this morning I'm preaching on Timothy because that's part of our annual theme. And today's the first Sunday in December that we haven't had a guest speaker. So we're going to introduce the theme for the month like we always do. And what's our text in class this morning? One of the eight passages in the entire New Testament about Timothy. <laughs> so that's funny, and we're going to work on this, and I'm going to use it a little bit in my lesson too. So we're kind of just going to get it all of it, okay? You're going to know everything there is to know about Timothy by the time I'm done with the lesson this morning. We'll even make up some things, okay? Uh, that was a joke. All right, this is the text. Before we jump into it, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you give to us. We thank you for our time of study this morning. We thank you for the book of Philippians and all the great truths revealed therein. Father, help us to have the strength and wisdom necessary to apply it vigilantly every day in our life. Pray that you'll bless us in this effort and this pursuit. Father, please be with our shepherds. Watch over them. And Father, please give us opportunities to share the good news with the people around us. Help us to have the courage to do it. May you be glorified and exonerated and exalted in all that we do to today and again in this evening. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Philippians 2. Philippians 2, verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he has served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard he was sick. For indeed he was sick almost to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly. That when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Re receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem. Because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. All right, this is question number 17. Question number 17 on your handout. <clears throat> What about them does Paul expect will encourage him? Verse 19. To know their state. Okay, I think I heard two people say that. To know their state. Question number 18. Why does he commend Timothy so strongly? Verse 20 and 21. Somebody give me one reason. He was like-minded like Paul. Somebody give me another reason. They'd worked together for a while, John. He was genuinely concerned for their, be their well-being. I, I really like all of that. Can somebody give me one more? He trusted him? Okay. Somebody give me one more. One. Look at verse 21. Say it again, Charles. Sincerely care for their state. He'll sincerely care for their state. I, I really like the way Paul commends Timothy in verse, 19, uh, verse 21. We're going to look at that in just a second. But I, I really, that is very high praise. Uh, Paul was 
constantly bent towards encouraging brethren, but he did not throw away compliments casually. All right? I mean, you think about all of the challenging comments Paul makes in his epistles. He does not compliment unless it is well deserved. And so when he just butters up Timothy here, we need to just take a second and think about how good Timothy really was. All right? Uh, question number 19. And, and you guys kind of, kind of were all around this just a little bit. Question number 19. How had Timothy proven his character? Served with Paul like a son? John? That was what you are going to say? Okay. He had served Paul like a son. So, and I think Mark mentioned this just a second ago, uh, trusted is what this is. He trusted Timothy. Why did he trust Timothy, guys? Had proven character. Charles? They'd both been in the gospel work together. It's a track record. That's what it is. Phyllis? Okay. Their history together. That, that's part of this discussion. Now, again, I'm going to talk about this a little bit in my lesson this morning, but Acts 16, verse 1 is where we're introduced to Timothy. Timothy, we are not told where he came from, okay? Um, now, we know his mother had faith, his grandmother had faith. So what does that really mean? Well, I, I, I think the evidence suggests that Timothy was a convert from Paul's first missionary journey in South Galatia. Timothy is a man, young man from Lystra who is well spoken of by the brethren. Well, if we're going to run the numbers here, that means, that means Timothy was converted in the late 40s. Paul's writing this epistle in the early 60s. So he has known Timothy for, what, 15 years? Maybe 18 years? I mean, we're, we're in that ballpark. So they have a history together. I do think, and again, some of this is almost just the inference from the, the way Paul describes him. Even this text hints at it. Paul constantly, in several places, calls Timothy his son in the faith. I, I, I think Paul had helped convert Timothy. But what can I say on that and go, oh, that's absolutely what that means. Well, I can't say that. That just seems to be the indication. Everybody kind of follow that? Make sure you see that difference. I'm not saying that's factually what Scripture says. Paul converted Timothy. No, it doesn't say that. But the indication suggests that Paul was instrumental in converting Timothy, especially when you start weighing in all the other information. He is from South Galatia. He is well spoken of by brethren. The suggestion then would be he was a convert in that area. Well, do the math. That's probably about the time Paul was through in his first journey. There aren't Christians there before that. So let's put it all together. The suggestion would be from the evidence, Paul converted Timothy. Um, I will not fist fight you in the parking lot on that position, okay? And uh, in fact, I will concede an arm wrestling match as well. Um, no need for violence here. Dennis? Dennis? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Very strong relationship. There, a lot of history there. A lot of history there. Um, and and I, I'm going to tell you, that's what's going on when you see things like his proven character. Well, these men had been in the trenches together. All right? Question number 20. Why does Paul seem to be waiting to send Timothy? Verses 23 and 24. Now, again, notice the key, uh, key word here. He seems to be waiting. All right? I'm not saying for sure that he is. I'm just saying that kind of seems to be what's happening in the text. So why? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, the, the most 
up-to-date and accurate information. Remember, one of the things Paul is combating here is misinformation. We're going to see that come up in just a couple of questions. Um, verse 20, or question number 22. We're going to see that come up a little bit. But Paul is combating misinformation. Believe it or not, and I can prove this, Philippi didn't even have dial-up internet. So there was no way for Paul to get relevant, accurate information there. All right, we're just seeing who's awake and who's not this morning. All right. Question number 21. What terms does Paul use to describe Epaphroditus? Somebody give me one. Brother? Okay, somebody give me another one. Fellow worker? Uh, what, what was it over here? Companion and laborer? Okay. Somebody give me a third one. Fellow soldier? Messenger? Uh, I think we're missing one. Minister. Minister. Every one of those terms, folks, is loaded. Loaded. Uh, a word doesn't mean anything out of context. I mean, I hope we understand that. We, we, you know, words only really... I mean, we say, well, that word means this. You guys realize that that's not actually accurate? Words don't mean anything out of a context. So when we read a definition for a word, what we're looking at is the probable meaning of the word. That's why you open up an Oxford English Dictionary. It doesn't usually have just one definition. It has four or five or six suggested definitions. And then the context is used to determine which definition is most likely. Words have meaning in context. So the words that Paul uses here are loaded with significance and then loaded with even more significance because of the context in which they are found. Every one of them means something. Brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, messenger, ministered, which the word minister there is not a noun. It's a very, that he ministered, he served, but every one of them is important, isn't it? All right. Question number 22. What had they heard about Epaphroditus, and was it true? Seriously ill, and it was true. Question number 23. In what way did God have mercy on Epaphroditus? Say it, say it again, Mary. He spared, he spared his life. He spared his life. So who benefited from this? And that's kind of a trick question. Paul. Anybody else? Do what? Do what? Epaphroditus. But, but I, want, I want you to say this too, in the church. I want you to think about this though too. Um, in the context of Philippians 1, did Epaphroditus really benefit? Ooh, think about that. See, Epaphroditus was in a situation like Paul in chapter 1 where Paul says, man, I'm ready to go and be with the Lord. But if I have to keep on going, I'll keep on going. So really, did Epaphroditus benefit? By the way, this is somewhat of a philosophical question, okay? With a little bit of theology in it. Somebody heal, gets healed from sickness. Uh, maybe this is something we need to think about more. We're really, really quick to pray for people to get better. But if they're right with the Lord, why? Have you ever thought about that? Sometimes that's not necessarily what we should be praying for. Now, I recognize there may be a lot of good they need to do still. Um, and that needs to be part of the discussion too. But man, why are we so quick to make people stay here when the alternative is there? Do what, Phyllis? Well, and I'm not saying go kill them, okay? I'm not saying, ex I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying extradite the process, okay? But, but I am saying maybe we need to give that a little bit of thought. Uh, question number 24. Question number 24. What does Paul tell them to do? Verse 29. Receive Epaphroditus. Okay, why is that? Because of his service. Because of the way this man worked and had worked for them. So then that final question, to what extent did Epaphroditus serve? Verse 30. To what extent did Epaphroditus serve? 
Okay. Okay. Look at verse 30. Say it again, Woody. Okay, for, yeah, for others. I, notice, what, notice how Paul says this in verse 30, guys. So, for the work of Christ, he came close to death. So to what extent did Epaphroditus serve? Nearly all of it. I mean, you kind of go back in your mind a little bit to Paul's words that verse 17, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. Remember Jack's comment in class, last class, Jack made the observation. That means emptying out. You take a container and you begin to pour it out. What happens when it's empty? Container's empty. There's nothing left. And that's the image Paul's using a little bit, that this is something he's offering himself. He's pouring out completely himself. Well, in that same context now, we have something said about Epaphroditus, that to the extent that he came close to death. I mean, you, in the, let's think about that pouring out again. Epaphroditus almost poured out everything in the service to the brotherhood. All right? And so that's what's going on here. Make sure you kind of catch that in that text. All right. Does anybody have any questions before we go through the text? All right, back up in verse 19. Now, I'm not going to spend as much time on this earlier text with Timothy because, I, again, I'm going to use part of this text for the lesson this morning. So <clears throat> I'm just going to make a couple of, of, of quicker observations from the text and then we'll just kind of move right ahead. So verse 19, he says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. You see this actually in the early chapter of Philippians as well, the text we refer to several times, Philippians 1, 19 through 26, where Paul is expressing there's some trepidation. He's not totally sure what's going to happen with this imprisonment at, at Rome but he trusts in the Lord Jesus to sustain him either way. In fact, he says, I think the scales are tipped a little bit even, that, that I'm going to be released from this. And so you see some of that same terminology being used here. He's not certain about a lot of things, but he is certain he can trust in Jesus. So he is trusting in Jesus to send Timothy shortly. Timothy's going to do a lot of good work in this congregation. Timothy's needed here because of some of the things going on Remember, you've got some of this inner conflict, which is hinted at through the epistle, and then it comes to head with Yodia and Syntyche in chapter 4. You've got outer conflict as well, where you've got some pressures coming in from the outside world, and you're seeing some of that pop up. Suffering's a part of the Philippian epistle, and the joy that counteracts that. And so, Timothy's going to help those. Timothy's going to help with this quite a bit. Now, there's some challenges here with Timothy and Epaphroditus. Um, I, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. One of the, the criticisms of Philippian epistle is if Paul is in Rome, you're looking at a long ways between Philippi and Rome. How many trips are there back and forth? And if Paul is in prison in Rome for two years, Acts 28, is there enough time in two years for this many trips to have occurred. And so that's why some people look at, look at the Philippian epistle and they say, well, this may not be totally accurate then. I don't think that that's fair. There's a lot of ways we could solve those issues, and, and I, I, I won't preach that whole lesson right now. But just observe, um, there's three to four trips between Philippi and Rome, and it would take about a month and a half to make one trip. So if we're just going back and forth a few times, you could do all of this in about a year, all right? That's still a lot of traveling, though, guys. Remember, I mean, remember how much traveling Paul's doing at the end of Acts? It takes a long time to get from Caesarea all the way to Rome, especially with a shipwreck in there in Malta. But this is a lot of back and forth. That's part of what's going on, and that's also part of the discussion with Epaphroditus, Okay? And we'll, we'll say that when we, when we get to Epaphroditus. But there's a lot of back and forth. But Paul wants to be encouraged by them. So he's going to eventually send Timothy there for verse 20. I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Now, you, you think about the way that that works. 
this is not an indictment against all the other people that are with Paul. If we think about Romans, remember all the Christians, Romans 16, all the Christians who are in Rome. you got some big, big names in Rome at this time. If this is the first imprisonment in Rome at the end of the book of Acts, you've got other big names that are with Paul at this time. Okay, So it's not saying, oh, well, they're just kind of all scoundrels, and Timothy's the only one that's worth anything. No, that's not his point at all. Instead, Timothy is that impressive. It's not that everybody is so bad. It's that Timothy is really honestly that good. Timothy is that dependable. He can count on him, and he knows it. And part of that discussion then is his absolute, absolute sacrificial service towards other people. Remember in the context, we've got Philippians 2, 5 through 8, where he talks about having the mind of Christ Jesus. Christ was humble and servant-oriented. He's putting Timothy here in this context to say Timothy's like that too. Now, not to the same extent of Jesus. There's no question about that. But Timothy's pretty good. Timothy is a servant at heart. He seeks the things that are not his own, but the things that are of Christ Jesus. Um, (coughs) That is really important. He is focused on a Christ-centered message. Everything Timothy does is really like Paul. All goes back to Jesus, the Bible class answer. Dennis? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the perilous nature of traveling in the first century, this was not running out for bread and eggs, okay? Um, this was a big, big process. In fact, you may recall 2 Corinthians 11 where Paul talks about that he was, he was vandalized. Uh, I mean, he, he talks about some of the perils of his journey. But guys, you talk, you talk about the, um, the parable of the Good Samaritan. What happened to him? He fell among robbers. That was common. That was the reason they traveled in groups. Because if you traveled with just a few folks, yeah... It was dangerous, and so it took a backbone. It took some courage because Timothy, and Timothy had shown it, and Timothy had shown it. Let's look a little further here, verse 22. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he has served with me in the gospel. Um, They had known his proven character. Well, let's kind of just go back in the the history of Acts here. Timothy's introduced in Acts 16, verse 1, Where does Paul go in Acts 16? In fact, where is most of Acts 16 happening? That wasn't a trick question. Where is most of Acts 16? I'm not not going to make you say it, Chris. Philippi. Yeah, it wasn't a trick question, guys. It's taking place in Philippi. Paul is sent in to Macedonia... Okay, the region where Philippi is in Acts 16. And almost all of Acts 16 takes place in Philippi. That's where Lydia, the seller of purple, is. That's where the little demon-possessed girl is that Paul casts out the demon and they shut him in prison. This is where Paul and Silas are bound and singing praises to God at midnight. All of that happens in Acts 16. Guess who's with Paul when he's in Philippi? Timothy. Timothy's right there with him. Now, it is interesting that Timothy is not arrested with Paul and Silas. And we could speculate all day long as to why that may be. It may be because of how young he was. Um, it may be because he's not uh, the front speaker. We know Paul was, a, he was, he was the primary speaker. Silas would have been right there with him. Paul and Silas are shut into prison. Timothy is not. And it may have something to do with his Greek father. No idea. No idea. But we, it's very obvious in the text that the we section drops off right as about Luke, uh, or as Luke's recording when Paul and Silas are shut into prison. Luke's not with him anymore, neither is Timothy, okay? Um, but they knew Timothy. In fact, they probably knew him pretty well. 
There's something else that I want you to notice. As a son with his father, he has served with me in the gospel. Uh, That expression could be lost on us a little bit because this is not the way our culture works anymore. But for centuries, the human experience would take the son and he would shadow his father. And so whatever dad did is what son did, right? For centuries, guys, that's the way that it worked. And so your dad was a farmer, guess what you were going to be? A farmer. Your dad was a carpenter, guess what you're going to be? A carpenter. And isn't it interesting that that's exactly the way Jesus is described? He's the son of the carpenter, but in Mark 6, he is not called the son of the carpenter, he's just called a carpenter. Because you were going to be what your daddy was going to be. Paul is borrowing some of those same social practices here when he talks about Timothy. Timothy's a son serving with his father. Because what Paul was, was Timothy's spiritual father. Now, maybe a lot of reasons to why that that would be that way. Maybe his dad, I mean, we, we, we think it's pretty clear that his dad's not a believer. But maybe his dad's not alive anymore. And so Paul has taken this somewhat somewhat orphaned, though he has a mother and a grandmother, but a somewhat orphaned boy who is a Christian alongside him. Lots we can say there, none of it we can say with certainty, okay? But, but just kind of notice that. that. That's part of why he's pulling in some of that language there, and it sometimes is lost on us. But that's a really, it's a really intimate comment, okay? This, Paul doesn't have a wife. Paul doesn't have children. But Paul has adopted Timothy. Timothy's his, Okay? Uh, maybe there's an application for us to think about. Uh, maybe you don't have children. Maybe you don't have believing children. Well, look around. There's a Timothy for you somewhere. Okay? Or a, uh, what would be a female version of Timothy? I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't go there. Um, uh, no, I can't think of anything, and I don't want to get into the transgender stuff. So look at verse 23. Verse 23. Look at, look at how he says this. Therefore... I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me, but I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Same truth he expressed in chapter 1. This is going to work out. Not sure how it's going to work out yet, but it's going to work out. I want to send Timothy with the good stuff so that you can be comforted, you can be reassured, and we'll just kind of get this going, okay? So jump into verse 25. (coughs) Yet I consider it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard he was sick. For indeed he was sick almost to death, but God had mercy on him and not only on him but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Uh, Epaphroditus is, is a faithful minister, a faithful deliverer, of all of this stuff that Paul is talking about. I, I think it's kind of important to note, in this context, Paul is stressing how important it is to follow the right example. You may remember chapter 1, he's talking about preachers who do it from impure motives. He celebrates the gospels being preached, but they're not, they don't have the right motives. And he goes into chapter 2 talking about how we should operate, how we should behave, and then he presents Jesus Christ as the chief example that we all follow. But what he does after talking about Jesus in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, is he turns right around to talking about two other men who are worth following, worth imitating. Timothy, then Epaphroditus. Men who excel at serving Christ Jesus. Men who exemplify the attitudes and the dispositions that he admonished them to have in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Okay? So that's why these two men are presented here. It's out of, maybe it's out of context for us a little bit, because where does Paul normally mention people? The beginning of the epistle and at the end of the epistle. And yet in Philippians, he's like, oh, hey, by the way, here's two dudes who are doing pretty well. What are we talking about here all of a sudden, Paul? It's because he's talking about men they could follow, examples that they could imitate. Timothy and Epaphroditus. Every one of those terms reminds us of that significance. These two men are worth following because I'm going to tell you, folks, it is no short order to be described by the Apostle Paul as a brother, a fellow worker, a fellow soldier, a messenger, and one who ministered. 
piggyback on Dennis's point a minute ago. That is one perilous journey. You think about how much more dangerous it would be if you're carrying money from a church in Macedonia across the Roman Empire to drop off with Paul who is in house, who is in, in house arrest in Rome. This is why Paul describes Epaphroditus as a brother, as a fellow worker, as a fellow soldier, as a messenger, and as one who ministered. Yeah, Epaphroditus was faithful. Faithful. Um, note, notice the, the term soldier. All of these seem like, okay, well, I, I see kind of what's going on here. That, that really fits this context. But what is soldier doing here? Um, remember part of the, the, the dynamics of Philippi You've got a socioeconomic organization, okay? That's how they are laid out in Philippi. It is, a, it is a big deal to be Roman. It is a big deal because Philippi was considered little Rome, all right? And you may remember in my introduction comments, I made the point, Philippi was a heavily influenced soldier colony. Because of the civil wars that had been fought in that region and Philippi's loyalty to Augustus, he relocated retired Roman soldiers to Philippi and gave them plots of land. So you've got some of the, the socio-rhetorical uh, background here and why Paul chooses particular terms the way he does. Every word matters, okay? Every word matters. You want to talk about true and faithful soldiers? You won't find them wearing the Roman insignia. You'll find them wearing the banner of Christ. Men like Epaphroditus. Okay? Dennis? Some, some yeah. Yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And bravery, bravery to face what he was facing. N notice what he says here, verse 26. So Epaphroditus was faithful to his commission. Verse 26, he was longing for you all. He was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. I, I really like the way Paul does this. He wasn't distressed that he almost died from his sickness. You catch that? Verse 30, he's going to say, he almost died. He, he, yeah, the, the, he really, truly almost died for the work of Christ. But Epaphroditus is not stressed out because he almost died from sickness. He's distressed because brethren had heard he was sick and they were hurting. Okay? That's a really kind of a subtle thing mentioned in that text. We might skip over it, but don't. Okay, so he was, he was sick. In fact, verse 27, he was sick almost to death. Everything about this is not indicating that Paul, Paul is saying, well, Epaphroditus, he was sick, um, and it was bad, he almost died. No, 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 Paul's indicating the context of Epaphroditus being sick was in an effort to satisfy what he had been asked to do. So this would either be he got sick on the journey to Rome, got sick while he was in Rome waiting to meet up with Paul, he got sick while he was doing what they asked him to do, all right? And yet he was still faithful to it. He stuck to it, was faithful to the commission, carried through because God, verse 27, had mercy on him and on him uh, and on Paul also, lest Paul should have sorrow upon sorrow. Uh, again, I, I don't mean to, to, you know, cast that in a weird light because it does say Paul had mercy or God had mercy on him. Okay. God allowed him to continue because there was still work that needed to be done. Epaphroditus was instrumental in getting that work done, in sustaining Paul to get that work done. And so that, 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 clearly that's going on here. Uh, Curtis? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, and that's a, that's, a, that's a fair observation of the text. Um, they didn't go around just using their miraculous abilities willy-nilly. 
they, they used them for a purpose. And Epaphroditus here being sick almost to the point of death um, wasn't necessarily going to further the cause of the gospel. Uh, it's a fair point from the text. Um, I, I will say that there, there may be some indication uh, to the point about how many journeys are going on back and forth here. Uh, part of the confusion is added by thinking about things that aren't in this text. It is very possible to solve some of that journey issue stuff. Epaphroditus may have been in Rome before Paul even got there. Um, you think about how well known at this point, how long Paul had been journeying to Rome. I made that point earlier. When he leaves Caesarea in the eastern side of the Mediterranean and it takes him so long to get to Rome, do you think brethren had heard about his, his, his predicament by then? Probably so. Okay? It's not unreasonable to think Epaphroditus has already been sent from Philippi and is waiting in Rome for Paul to get there. All right? That might also explain so, how many journeys went back and forth. Uh, I'm probably throwing out stuff there that you don't really care about. But that's okay. That's okay. All right, look at verse 28. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. So Paul says, I, I, I am really excited to send him. I want to get him there <coughs> to lighten my sorrow even more in this other respect, receive him, verse 29. Part of that statement is almost like take him back because he did what he was asked to do. Um, Epaphroditus is one of them. Epaphroditus is from this region, if not from the city of Philippi. And so all of what's going on here is, that's indicated by verse 25, by the way, the way that Paul describes him. But all that's going on here is you take him back because he did his job. All right? don't, don't, don't think when he comes home he didn't do his job because he got sick. No, Paul's saying he did his job, almost cost him his life because of how sick he was. But you bring him home, welcome him back, he did his job. Okay? Uh, look, look at that last line of verse 29, hold such men in esteem. That's what we're talking about in this context, guys. Emulate Jesus Christ, verses 5 through 11. Do it like Timothy's doing it, verses 19 through 24. Yeah, do it like Epaphroditus, verse 25 through 29. You hold such men in high esteem because they're doing it right. And so follow what they're doing. Verse 30, and he repeats this. Okay, so if you missed it in the earlier verses... You're getting it again. Paul does not waste words. When he repeats information, it's because it is that significant. He's like, okay, well, maybe you didn't quite understand what I just said to you. Epaphroditus almost died because of what he, what he went through. So just in case you missed that point, let me stress it again. So for the work of Christ, he came close to death. I don't know what that means. But I'm going to tell you what. It means Epaphroditus almost died. Was he laid up in a sick bed? in uh, Roman, uh, Rome General Hospital? I, I, I don't think so. Um, don't know. But he almost died. But here's part of why Paul stretches that again, because it's the attitude Epaphroditus approached this subject with. Look at that. He came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. That's why I said, this is not just, oh, he caught a little stomach bug, you know, as he was sitting at home about to leave on the journey. No, 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 no. He got sick while he was doing what they had asked him to do. So if that means on the journey he got sick, or if in Rome he got sick, I don't know. But he got sick doing what they asked him to do. All right? Um, stuff like that wasn't uncommon in the ancient world. Um, and so he, no, there was no one stop and uh, no walk-in clinic. But... But he survived, and he carried on with what they had asked him to do. The, the phrase there, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me, um, does anybody have that worded differently? Maybe the ESV? What was deficient? Okay. Is anything different than that? So the way that that's phrased, it literally means your religious service. Um, you may remember... Romans 12 talks about this a little bit. What is your reasonable service uh, or what is your religious service? 
the ancient world, they didn't really separate those concepts. So to serve somebody, to give of yourself to somebody, was an act of devotion, an act of what we might almost pin as religious devotion. Now, now that obviously doesn't mean that they're worshiping Paul or something like that, but this is part of their service to God Almighty. And they're taking it seriously, which is why they're sending Epaphroditus, or sent Epaphroditus in the first place. And Paul says, you bring him home as one of yours because he did his job and he did it well. Okay? Um, well, there's just maybe a lot we, we would want to say about all that, but, but we better move into the application stuff here. <clears throat> so, I didn't share mine with you a couple of weeks ago. I'll go ahead and share mine with you this time. Because um, I, I, I think that the four I have here from this text are, are, are going to be a little helpful. Um, so, one application from this context... We need to give some thought to this. Do we sincerely care for one another? Uh, you look at the way Paul describes Timothy. Look at the way Paul describes Epaphroditus. Look at their focus on the mission to, spare, uh, to share the gospel, to support brothers and sisters in Christ. Guys, that ought to step on our toes. We are, as American Christians, we are independent thinkers, which is both good and very, very bad. Okay? I, I, it's where the mentality is, oh, I can serve Christ Jesus, I don't need the church, comes from. And you may think, well, we don't have anybody like that. Yeah, we do. But they just show up on Sunday mornings occasionally. Okay? Um, guys, we've got to get away from that mentality. The brotherhood, brothers and sisters in Christ, that's family. Family language. And you see it pop up even when it's not the focus of the text. Verse 20 is a prime example of that. Paul says, no one like-minded like Timothy. No one who will sincerely care for your state. Why? Because they're family. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe we need to rethink that a little bit. Do we? Do we sincerely care for one another? Number two. Um, I really like this point. I like it so much it's going to find its way in the sermon in just a minute. Um, do we, or excuse me, are you, are you the type of person that Paul would want to send? Um, and so I don't belabor that point. I'll just leave that there because I am going to make that a big old point in my sermon in just a minute. But we need to really give some thought to that, folks. Number three, <coughs> do the titles used for Epaphroditus fit you? Listen again. And I'm, I'm gonna, I'll change this so that it's gender neutral. My sibling, fellow worker, fellow soldier, messenger, one who ministered. Guys, does that describe you? Could that describe you? Because here's the deal. It should describe you, but does it? It did Epaphroditus. Number four. Do you disregard your life for service toward the gospel and brethren? I'm not sure I like the way that's worded, but anyway. Notice how, again, Epaphroditus is described. He's sick to death, almost. <laughs> that was a, a play on words. But anyways, he, he's almost sick to death. Um, and then, verse 30, we'll put all that together again. The reason he was like this was because he didn't regard his own life. He instead was so focused, so bent on, to, on supplying what was lacking in their service. Uh, again, twofold. To serve the brethren, to serve the gospel. Does that describe you? Do you disregard your life for service of brethren and the gospel? If it doesn't, folks, we've got a problem. There is a, an insufficiency there is something, there is an area where you are supremely deficient. We need to re reorient the way that we approach the world and what we look at and what we focus on and where our attentions are because, guys, this is what life is. It is disregarding ourselves to serve others. Isn't that what Jesus is described as doing in Philippians 2, 5 through 11? Isn't that why Paul says, have the mind which is in Christ Jesus? Guys, that's us. It's supposed to be. I think right here, of course I know that was the second bell, 
I think right here, folks, is one of the, the greatest challenges to American Christianity is the independent attitude we approach every subject with and the total disregard for selflessness. We are an independent, selfish society. And we can't be that if we're going to be faithful to Christ Jesus. Okay? Uh, I appreciate your, your attention this morning. Appreciate your feedback. Appreciate some of the comments you guys made. We'll jump into this next section in class on Wednesday. And until then, uh, read the text. Uh, hey, and read Hebrews too if you're in that class. And